FPG. Uh, so welcome. Cheers. Uh, he is talking about. Uh, it's great getting new speakers, so it's always <laughs> worth a round of applause. Uh, he's talking about chapter seven and eight, which are really awesome chapters from FP and Scala that deal with. Let's start writing functional sort of uh, functional libraries and see how the patterns emerge and where we're going with that. So welcome, Matt. So. Ben stolen most of my introduction, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so, so far we've covered chapters one to six, which are all in part one of the textbook. And these are the first chapters that we'll cover off from, uh, from part two. So they really look at the impact that the fundamentals in part one have on designing a functional library uh, by way of a few examples. So I'm talking about the first two, purely functional parallelism, which I always struggle to say, and property-based testing. So, why do we care about purely functional parallelism? So, systems are becoming more and more distributed. Um, modern computers have multiple cores and multiple CPUs, and shared mutable memory still sucks. Um, we've got race conditions you have to deal with, deadlocks, and testing this stuff is particularly difficult. So, just as we've done in the previous chapters, we'd really like to be able to use the substitution model um, to reason about our code so that we We'll do that in this chapter by um, separating the concern of describing a computation from actually running it. So running it's really a separate issue that we can leave up to, to the library. So to start with, a, um, we'll just go through a simple example. And I do mean really simple. Uh, so this is just to sort of ground us a bit later on so we can come back to this. So summing a list of integers. You've got a sequence of integers, you fold across that and accumulate your value. Easy, right? You can do this same operation using a, a divide and conquer algorithm, and you can parallelize this because you can do um, the sum of your left sublist and of your right sublist um, in parallel. So summing integers is probably so fast that you would never bother doing this. Um, but we don't really care about the operation here. We're just thinking in terms of the um, data types and functions that we'd need to support doing this if we wanted to. So ignore how silly it is to be splitting sublists up just to sum. So if we think about this example, we can start thinking of some data types and functions that we'll need. So if we just think in terms of a very rough API that we're not, you know, we've got no implementation for and that's probably going to change as we work through our design, we can think that we would need some kind of container type for our results. So we'll call that, uh, that type a par. So that's a par for parallel computation. And that type is parameterized over the return value of the parallel computation, so we'll call that A. So if we've got that par type, then we need some way to create a unit of parallelism. So that's our unit function here. Given some A, and unit takes a lazy argument there, return a parallel computation, returning a result of type A. And then if we've got those two, we obviously need some way to sort of get our value out of that parallel computation. So we've got to get it. So ignoring the fact that we don't have implementations for any of this stuff yet, we can uh, change our simple sum example to use this API. So you can see we've got some left, some right, those are wrapped in calls to uh, par.unit, and then we do our blocking call <coughs> later on when we're trying to get the arguments to the plus operator. So in this example, in order to get any sort of um, parallelism, the unit operator sort of has to start evaluating its arguments as soon as it's called. Because if we didn't, we'd only try to sort of force the evaluation of our parallel computation when we're already in the call to get, in which case we're going to block on that result anyway. And you know, we're back where we started from. We'll basically do all this work, create a parallel computation, and then block on it here, and then block on the next <laughs> one. So not much point doing that. But if we make that make that design choice and say that unit is going to start evaluating its, uh, its computation immediately, then we've really introduced a side effect here. So if we want to be able to use the substitution model, these two expressions should really be equivalent, because all we're doing here is sort of inlining our sum L and sum R values. But if we do that, then this one's going to be parallel, and this one isn't. So already we've sort of lost. Um, we've done exactly what we wanted to avoid, which is refactoring, sort of change the behavior of our program. So 
the, pro the problem with this is that calling get breaks the referential transparency. So if unit doesn't start evaluation of a parallel computation immediately, but we want to compute um, the sums of the two sublists in parallel, then it seems we need some way to combine those two parallel values, to, sorry, two parallel computations, and create a third computation from those two computations. So we've come up with a, a pretty simple example, explored it a little bit, and we've experimented and learned something, something pretty important, which is that we can't have um, units start evaluating its arguments, and we can't have side effects anyway, because they'll bite us later on. So, combining parallel computations. We just imagine for now we have some function uh, map2, which takes a parallel computation returning an A, another computation returning a B, some function f to combine those two, and gives you back a computation that returns a C. Ignoring the implementation of that for now, we can sort of change our example to use it already. So we're no longer calling unit or get in our recursive case, so there's no blocking going on here, and we can still just call unit in our base case. So map2 is then free to sort of start evaluating its left, the left and right sublists, the sums of the left and right sublists um, in parallel. <coughs> but we probably don't always want map2 to do that. If we've got some you know, crappy computation that's not really worth forking off a separate thread for, we'd like to be able to just do that on the current thread. So with our current API, there's no way for the caller to sort of specify, yes, this should be forked onto a separate thread, or no, don't bother, this can be run on the main thread. So we can just add in a method to do that. Just assume this exists for now. So fork takes a value of type A, sorry, a parallel computation of type A, lazily, and then returns another computation parallel computation type A. So we can add that into our sum example. Um, we'll call fork in the two, uh, the two recursive calls there, and again, units unchanged in the base case. So assuming that fork has some way of marking a computation for concurrent evaluation, then what we've done is put the parallel, parallelism explicitly under programmer control, so we're not making any arbitrary decisions about how our library should behave. So previously, um, unit had accepted its arguments lazily, but now that we have fork, unit can accept its arguments strictly, and we won't, and we can use a derived combinator lazy unit for cases where we don't want to fully evaluate this value um, a on the main thread. So lazy unit is what's called a derived combinator, as it's simply implemented in terms of other combinators. Again, we haven't defined unit anywhere. We'll get to that in a bit. So just like we decided um, unit shouldn't have any side effects, it doesn't seem like a good idea to have fork evaluating values on a separate thread as soon as it's called. What we do instead is we think of fork as just uh, marking an unevaluated parallel computation for concurrent evaluation. So a par is now uh, a data structure destroying a computation, not some kind of conceptual container that we just grab values out of when we need. Does that make sense to everyone? There's a, there's a big sort of shift there in terms of our initial API and what we're doing now. Yeah? Seeing some blank looks? It'll make more sense in a little bit, I promise. So, par is basically a program that describes a computation. So, instead of having get, we'll call that run to make the intent of what's going on there a little clearer. So, we're making some progress. We're learning about some problems with our initial design. And now, um, we just have to give run some means of implementing this parallelism. But before we do that, we should probably come back and actually um, decide on a representation for our par type. So what can we do with the par? We have a function to create a computation that returns immediately. We have a function to combine the results of two computations and return a third. We've got a function to sort of mark a computation to be executed concurrently and we have a way to fully evaluate a given parallel computation. And that might spawn off other computations as requested by earlier calls to fork. So there's a, a class in Java called an executor service. And it looks like we might be able to use this executor service to give 
um, run a means of implementing parallelism. So this is a Java API transcribed into Scala. The executor service has a method called submit, which takes a callable and returns a feature. So a callable is kind of just a lazy A for, for our intents and purposes. So if we just assume that executor service is going to do what we want it to do, then um, we can have our run method accept an executor service and a computation. And now if we finally come back to our par type and actually define that, we can have the par type actually just be a function from an executor service to a future. So par is a function that needs an executor service and the creation of the future doesn't happen until that's provided. So with these two cases, these two um, definitions here, then run really becomes pretty trivial to implement. You just give run your executor service, your parallel computation, and then you know, this is just a function, so apply this function to that argument and you get back a future. Have I lost anyone? No? Yes? <laughs> um, before we move on, we can have a look at what's possible with the API that we've got so far. So we've got our par object, our par type, our run method, which we just defined, um, unit, which just uh, returns a future that's immediately finished. Uh, we've got map2, which given the, the way that our par type is defined, just submits the computations to the executor services, sorry, the executor service, and then returns a unit future wrapping our combinator function f. So this doesn't support timeouts um, like the future API normally does, and that's because we're not keeping track of how long we spent evaluating our first computation or how long we spent evaluating our second computation. So with map2, it's trivial to implement map. So map, as we've seen before, is sort of lifts a function of type a to b over some uh, container of type A, so in this case our container is kind of a parallel computation. So we'll get back a um, computation returning a value of type B. We could, uh, given some parallel computation returning a list, we could sort that list in parallel as well. And uh, we can actually finally implement our fork function. So this is the simplest sort of implementation for fork, but there's a bit of a problem with it because you'll see we're using this executor service twice here. So we're submitting this outer callable to the executor service. Then inside that callable, we're calling get on a future. So this is going to actually going to block if we only have one thread available. So we should really be using one thread to do this, but there's no way to implement it other than to use two threads. And this is a fundamental sort of problem with our somewhat hastily designed um, parallel computation model. So we'll come back to how, to how to potentially fix this later, but just keep in mind that at the moment, forking something actually takes two threads instead of one. So we've seen a function um, sequence in the past in previous chapters, and you can write a similar function over the par type. So given a list of computations, return a single computation that returns a list. Um, that's a homework exercise, which is good fun. If we've got sequence, then we can easily write this um, par map function. So we wrap the body of that par map function in a fork. So that means that anytime someone calls par map, that will return immediately, and then later on, when run is called, it will spawn a computation, which itself spawns a computation for every element in the list. So we've been, been blindly sort of following types and, and hacking things together, but we should really take a step back and formalise how we expect this API to behave. So a concrete example, um, if we've got a computation returning a 1 and we map some increment of function over that, we expect that to be equivalent to a computation that returns a 2. Right? So no magic there. And that's a more um, specific case of this general law, which is that if we map any function f over a, um, a computation returning value x, then it should be the same as having a computation 
that returns f or e, um, f of x or e inside that computation. So we're saying this should hold for any choice of f and any choice of x, which places some, some good constraints on our implementation. It means that our implementation of unit can't sort of inspect the provided values and poke around and behave differently depending on its input. So you can do no downcasting or instance objects. Because remember, par is completely generic over type A. Unit shouldn't be able to um, sort of behave differently depending on its input. So if that's the case, then um, we can reason about what would happen if our function f was the identity function. Identity function. So we'll replace f with id. Then you see we end up with, um, so our d of x is just x. You can see we end up with unit x on both sides. So we'll, that means that we can really, this law doesn't sort of uh, care about what parallel computation we're running. So what we've ended up saying, we're specifying that for any future, sorry, any parallel computation, mapping identity of that should be exactly the same as the initial computation. So this is good because we've, um, we've now got a simpler law that doesn't even mention unit at all. And laws like this are really handy when reasoning about your code and when testing it using a property-based testing library, as we'll see in the next chapter. There's one more law around uh, forking. So if you run a computation on the current thread or on another thread, you want those to be the same. You can probably see why well, that's, a, that's a good property for a parallel computation <laughs> library to have. Um, but when we do this, we're really saying that we expect fork of x to equal x for all choices of x and for any choice of executor service. But some executor services are backed by a fixed size thread pool. So, does anyone know what will happen if we try and do this? Remembering our earlier problem with fork. It's going to be very sad. <laughs> also that, yes. So we've got, a, we've got a thread pool of size one and fork required two threads. So this is just going to deadlock forever, which is, which is no good at all. And there's really, there's no way to fix this with our current uh, representation for the par type. The textbook does go on to um, sort of fix this using an implementation that uses actors. And I'll leave that up uh, up to you guys because it's a it's a really good exercise that um, that shows how you can use side effects as an implementation detail and still have a purely functional API. So even though you've got all this funky stuff going on inside your um, your non-blocking implementation inside your actor, as long as that API is pure, then the user of the library doesn't really have to care about it, and it means you get away from our problem of using two threads when one should do. Before we finish up, I just want to talk about um, another thing that I think is an important point of this chapter, which is that sometimes a combinator is just a special form of a more general combinator. So as an example, if we have this function choice here, which says, you, it's basically saying use the result of this computation to pick which computation to run next. So we've got our first computation returning Boolean, if that's true, we use this uh, t value as our next computation. If it's false, we use our f value. But why should we restrict the caller of this to just two alternatives? So we can make this more general by allowing, say, n alternatives in a list. So say our first computation return an integer, then we can just grab the next computation out of a list, you know, assuming that your caller is not crazy and gives you enough computations in that list. <coughs> but even the choice of list is slightly arbitrary, really. As long as we have some, some function here to say, given a value of type A, tell me the next computation to run, we can implement this. So choice n can be implement, implemented in terms of chooser. Choice can be implemented in terms of choice n or chooser. So chooser is really the most uh, generic form of this type of operation. And if you kind of squint at chooser, we've seen functions like this in previous chapters normally called flat map, so I think we've seen flat map over lists in the data structures chapter. So it's just given some f of a and a function from a to an f of b, give me back an f of b. So this is 
this shouldn't really be a surprise by now. Uh, if we abstract stuff enough, we often end up with flat map and sequence and map and those sorts of operations. So flat map's really a very, a very general function that we look into in more detail in part three of the book, I think. I'm not up to that yet. <laughs> um, so we could do this with some of the other combinators as well, but I think by now you probably get the point. Just before implementing a specific combinator, look to see if it's just a specific case of a more, more general, powerful combinator. So we've completed the design of a library for defining parallel and asynchronous computations in a purely functional way, even if our library has a massive gaping flaw in it. Um, we've explored the process of functional design to gain a sense of the challenges and solutions, and we've explored what it means for an API to form an algebra. So we've defined a collection of data types and functions, as well as laws and properties that we expect, um, that, sorry, that express relationships between these functions. If you're interested in this domain in particular, um, Parallel and Concurrent Programming in Haskell is a really good book, and it's free online. Before I power on to chapter eight, are there any questions from chapter seven? It's a bit, it's a bit hard to capture the, the meaning of these chapters because Unlike the previous chapters, they're not really about a specific topic like uh, laziness or error handling. If the main idea is to sort of capture that, um, that way of going about designing a functional library. So there's another example, and we'll go through this, and hopefully that will, that will make things a bit clearer if they're a bit hazy for you. So property-based testing. Um, is everyone here vaguely familiar with the concept? So yeah, you're just uh, separating the generation of test cases from the description of your program. That's the sort of high level view. So this, this example here is from ScalaCheck. So we've got a generator of lists of integers, which you know, if you sample from this generator, just gives you back a list of integers, and we'll give you a different one the next time. And then we have a property which combines that uh, that generator with a predicate that we expect to hold over all values that our generator will generate. So this for all method, in this case, we're testing that the reverse operator on the list data type behaves as we expect it to. So for any possible list, list if you reverse that list and reverse it again, it should be the same as your input list. And we can combine properties, so with our little AND operator at the end there, um, Similar sort of idea, for any possible list that you can generate, the first element of that list should be equal to the last element of the reverse list. So once we've got these properties, um, which are really sort of specifications about how our program should behave, then we can use this check method, is what it's called in Scala check. And what Scala check does for us here is generates, um, randomly generates 100 lists, runs our predicate over all of those, and then says, yes, we're all good our reverse operation is doing what we think it should. In the case of failure, uh, Scala check will try and shrink down the test case to the smallest, um, the smallest test case which falsifies your input, sorry, falsifies your program. And we'll uh, come back to that in a little bit more detail later. So as we did in the previous example, we're just going to, well in this case, we're just going to plagiarize them straight from Scala check. <laughs> but we can imagine that we're going to need some type for generating values. So we'll call that gen for generator. Again, it's generic over the type A, so that we don't need a separate type for every single you know, type that's present in our code. And if we've got a generator of type a generator of values of type A, then you can implement a list of n method like we were using in the previous example, which says um, just giving back a list with length n, and as long as you tell that method how to generate values of type A, it doesn't really have to care about what's in there. And then we have our for all method to create property. So we've sort of seen that we need to create properties, combine them, and finally run them with the check method. So the simplest representation that would let us do this is just having a property be sort of a single value of billion. But if we do that, we lose a lot of information around 
what caused the failure, so which test input um, falsified our property. So instead we will have um, our check method return either the case that caused the failure or some success counter to say, yep, I ran 100 properties and they're all good. So we haven't thought about the arguments to check yet, so we'll come back to that later and just talk about generators briefly. So at this stage, all we really want to do is randomly generate values. So we could just make, uh, make gen a type that wraps a state transition over a random number generator, and that gets us most of the behavior that we want. So I remember from the earlier chapters, um, this state type is basically a function that given some initial state will produce a tuple of a value and a new state. So our generator function is just a state transition from a random number generator. So give it a random number generator, it will give you back a value and the next value of your random number generator. So what if we wanted to, to make a generator of um, tuples where the second, tuples of strings, sorry, where the second element in the tuple only contains characters from the first. So this is a similar sort of problem to one that we saw in the previous chapter, um, where we wanted to choose a parallel computation to run based on the result of an earlier computation. So instead of um, this par type, we're doing the same kind of operation but over generators instead. So the symmetry between chooser and flat map is, uh, is no coincidence, and again, I'm promised that part three will explain all of this magic. Um, so we're seeing that we can already express some complicated kind of generators using combinators that we're familiar with. So back to properties. With what we've written so far, there's no way for our test test framework to know when to stop generating inputs and evaluating the predicate. So that's one thing with property-based testing. You sort of have to, at some stage, say, yep, I'm OK. I've tested this with like a 1,000 test cases, and it seems good. So rather than making an assumption of what that value should be, like 10 or 100 or 1,000 test cases, we can put this in our API and leave it up to the programmer to specify if they want to. And we can always add helper methods with sensible defaults later. As you saw, Scala checked it. We just said prop.check, and it ran 100 for us. So as we're now telling the property how many test cases to run, there's no point having the property tell us how many test cases it ran um, if our property passes. So we'll just have our result type be uh, an option or a maybe. So in the case of failure, we'll get back the failed case, so the input that caused our property to be falsified, as well as how many successes ran before we reached that falsified state. So we're using an option as a result type here when none is actually a success, which is a little backwards to how they are normally used. It's, it's a totally legitimate thing to do, but the intent of it isn't super clear, and the textbook goes on to add an explicit uh, result type, which has got a better meaning. So we've given prop a limit on the number of test cases to run. But in order to generate values it, uh, from a generator, it's going to need some source of entropy. So we'll just add in a random number generator from uh, chapter 5 or 6, I think it was. So a run function now takes two arguments, given a number of test cases to run and some source of entropy, it will return us a result. And that result is either um, none, which means your property has passed, or it's a tuple describing the input that caused the failure and how many test cases you did manage to run successfully. So we now know enough to implement for all to actually create one of these properties. So as we said, for all is basically a function that takes a number of test cases and a random number generator. And we're going to use this random stream function here. Um, I've left the implementation out. But what random stream will do is just create a uh, you know, infinite stream of random values of type A by sampling from your generator. So the implementation of this is in the textbook, but you can kind of imagine how you would do that. If we then zip that stream with a counter and then take uh, n test cases from that, then what we're going to have is a stream 
of tuples, and each tuple is an input to our predicate and a, uh, a counter so that we can keep track of how many predicates we've, how many times we've evaluated the predicate. So we can map over that stream and pattern match out our input and our counter and evaluate our predicate. So we call it, have our predicate passing the input. If that value is true, then we're good. We've, um, this test case has passed. Otherwise, this test case has falsified our property. So as we said, we capture the value that caused our property to be falsified, so we can print it out to the user later. So using to string is generally frowned upon, but it's uh, all we're doing with this value is printing it back out to the user, so it's, it's legit. Um, we can then go through this stream and just sort of try and find the first, uh, the first result that falsifies our property. So remember that streams are lazily evaluated, so if the first property um, the first test case, sorry, falsifies our property, then we won't you know, go through and run a thousand tests unnecessarily. We also uh, catch exceptions for the same reason, so that we can report which input, um, which input caused the property to be falsified. So, as we've said, we're just sort of randomly generating test cases. Now, it might happen that we generate some ridiculously complicated input as our first example, and it falsifies our property, which leaves us with a more difficult debugging task than if we had tried with a really simple input first. So say you have some function over lists. If your, um, your function is broken for every single possible list, then it would be better that you run a test case for a list with a single element in it first, rather than having a you know, thousand element long list get, uh, get generated and then splat it all over your console and you're left wondering which element in this list caused your, your dodgy program to fail. So Scala check solves this problem by using test case minimization. So given some failing test case, Scala check's got all these smarts where it sort of iteratively shrinks your test case down to the smallest input that will still cause a failure. So we're going to use um, sized generation to get a similar outcome. This means that we generate inputs of a smaller size first. And once we're satisfied that our program is OK with inputs of that smaller size, only then do we increase and try our program with inputs of a larger size. So for lists, um, for example, the size probably relates directly to the length of your list. For a tree, the size might be the height of the tree or the number of nodes. It really depends on, on the data type that you're generating as well as how sensitive your program is to different properties of that data type. So we can leave our existing uh, generator type untouched and add this new type, a size generator. And all this essentially is, is a function. So given a size, give me back a generator, which will only generate values of that size. So to see what it looks like using a size generator, we can manually sample some values from one on the console. So we, we define our sgen here, and it will generate lists of length n. So we're using this list example again. If we say, give me back a size generator um, with size 1, Sorry, give me back a size generator and then apply the value 1 to that size generator. We'll get back a generator of lists of integers. And then if we sample from that generator of lists of integers, we will always only get back lists with one element in them. So we could say, we could do this again, and we could say sgen uh, 10 here, and then sample from it, and we get a list with 10 inches, integers in it. So currently our property is responsible for invoking the generator, but our property no longer knows enough to be able to do this, as the size generator requires uh, a size argument before it can invoke the underlying generator. So we'll, uh, we'll keep using this pattern, but we'll just add in a maximum size to our prop. So property now takes uh, a maximum size, a number of test cases, and a source of entropy. So this, I'll show just one possible way you could implement this function. It's kind of a simplistic, uh, simplistic implementation. But what we do is, um, first we work out how many test cases per size you want to run. So if you say, I want to run 100 test cases, and the maximum size I want to run is 10, we're going to run 10 test cases for each size. 
So that's a bit a bit simplistic because maybe you want to run you know more test cases on your bigger inputs in order to sort of stress them out a bit more. But uh, again, this is just one way you could implement this. So given the number of test cases, sorry, that's next. Um, given the stream of properties that we've created here, what we end up with is a bunch of properties where each property is just for a single size. So you can see here we're, we're calling our size generator and passing in the input size that we want. So we'll end up with a stream of properties um, and we'll have one property for each size. So given that stream of properties and the number of test cases we need to run, uh, we can combine those using our AND operator. And then finally, we just run that property in order to return a result. Does that make sense to everyone? This block of code's a little bit hairy. But yeah, you're basically just creating a stream and then you've got each element in that stream is a property for a single size and then you just sort of and all those together. So as I said earlier, you can use something like this to write a test suite for uh, parallel computations. But that's you know, something you should all do when you go home. Um, the book has a section on a full section on doing this, and it sort of goes through in quite a bit of detail. And I really recommend doing it so that you can see how to use property-based testing in a uh, you know a non-trivial kind of domain. Because there's only so many times you can reverse lists and expect something different to happen. So as we did with our um, our par type, we can sort of think about the laws that would apply to a generator. So just as we had map for par, we can write a very similar function over a generator. And not only did these functions have similar um, signatures, the same law even holds about mapping identity over a value. So that means that these functions really have similar meanings in their respective domains. And again, I'm promised that in part three we will learn the names of these, these patterns that keep cropping up. So we've gone through and implemented another half-baked library, and we've learned a bit more about functional design. And we've seen that by sort of oscillating between our abstract algebra and the concrete representation, we, uh, we avoid overfitting our library to a particular representation, but it sort of keeps us grounded in that it's never too hard to implement our algebra when we want to. We also noticed that we needed many of the same combinators, so map, flat map, sequence, etc. There's a really great quote in the book about this, which is that there are a great many seemingly distinct problems being solved in the world of software, yet this ace of functional solutions is much smaller. And that's it. The slides will be up online, and I definitely recommend doing all the exercises from the chapter. Any questions? <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Does it bother you that double ampersand is kind of broken? That it doesn't thread state from the previous properties yeah. through? I noticed that when I was testing it because <laughs> it'll do. You use the same seed like for every for all. I can understand yeah. why they did it, but it's, it's good. And it's also if. Say the example where you have 100 test cases and 10 sizes. If you're doing something with lists and you know, you'll generate 10, 10 empty lists and your property's fine, and then you'll do a list with you know, one element in it, and if that falsifies your property, you get back the response, the output from this is falsified. We ran one test case and it broke. Whereas you've actually, you could have done that, but because you're just adding these together, you're kind of throwing away the previous properties. Um, so I don't know who wrote this, some fool. <laughs> I, no, I, I think it's just simplicity so you didn't have to yeah. thread stuff through the yeah, result. Yeah, it'd get it'd get, even it'd get gnarly. And yeah. It's already noisy enough, right? Yeah. So maybe that's an extra homework exercise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to power into the elusive part three. Any other questions, comments? Do you know what the thing is called that abstracts those? You can't say the F. Or are you just, you know. <laughs> it's a burrito. <laughs> the M word, too. <laughs> um, yeah, so Funk is in my ads. 
no very nice. I suspect that that ampersand probably uh, problem will be resolved in the next sequence. Um, probably. Yeah. So what if you have, you have a, characters on the a list of properties and you, yeah, yeah. That would make this funky slide a little less funky. The other weird thing here is that you're creating all these properties initially, but you're not telling those properties how many test cases to run, which is why you then map over them, and throw away the number of test cases, and then run it with a new number of test cases. Do you know why it's done like that in the book? I've I have no idea. Because you could just use a better, <coughs> you know, you could just add your number of test cases into your for all and avoid doing that whole map. I think. I'm not sure I haven't thought about that much. It makes you feel good when you spot it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Maybe it's just a little Easter egg. All right. Cool. Um, Do you have a question? Oh. Oh, I was just, have you done all of the homework up to this point? Um, yes. Yep. How did you find the transition from part one to part two? Was it eye-opening or was it um, different? Or like they're, they're kind of problems you're solving are pretty. Yeah, they're not. They're not as trivial as the, the ones in the early chapters. Yeah, um, they're a bit more open-ended. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a couple of of exercises that I haven't done where it's super open-ended, like the the one to generate um, things to actually prove functions, so an exhaustive generation. Yeah. So our generators just randomly generate values, but if you, know, you want a, a generator to generate every single possible value in a data type, um, that's an exercise in the textbook to do that, but I skipped that one. I did look at the code and it, it's pretty hairy, so yeah, it would be good to go back and try and do it later. Yeah, I think in, in terms of trying to present this, I was really trying to capture the idea that you, you bounce between your you sort of high level design that does some implementation and then that implementation will inform your design. <coughs> the design will sort of guide you down the way of how you do your implementation. And that I think is the main the main takeaway from these two chapters and the next one about parsers. Um, it's really just a way of thinking about doing library design rather than learning you know, about a particular FP concept like laziness or error handling or something. Cool. Cool. Well done. Thanks, Matt.